Welcome. Appreciate you coming on today. Yeah, thanks very much, Joshua. Sure thing. For people who are, who are not familiar, please introduce uh, your, your, yourself, your, your business, sure. and what it is that you do. Yeah, let me. Um, I'm a book developer and a publisher. So um, I typically um, hire writers, although I can do some of the writing and laying things out. But for the most part, I hire people like you because, as you well know, ghost writers are really needed in any book project. I mean, it's, it's very rare you find somebody who's an author who can write. Although I do have a funny story about that, that because one time I talk, call, called uh, Tony Kornheiser and um, I talked about doing a book uh, that I titled, um, How You Doing? Because on his radio show, he hated people saying, how you doing? And so I called him up and I, at the fifth or sixth time I got him and I said, uh, Tony, I said, uh, I, I think you should write a book. Uh, we can call it, How You Doing? And he said, I don't have time to write a book. And I said, we can get a writer. And he said, I am a writer. And so he totally blew me off, but just the same. Um, in that case, he doesn't need a writer, but most people need writers. So um, as a book developer, I've been doing it since uh, my first book I published was in 94. Before that, I had gotten a, uh, a degree in marketing from, um, from, from college, went to work for a major Fortune 500 company. I went to work for selling Xerox copiers, primarily business door to door. So I made hundreds and hundreds of calls, did that for about three and a half years, and then went on my own. Uh, went into the business product area for initially, sold a similar project product as I did with Xerox to, to businesses and um, built a company doing that, had 10 employees. Um, and um, one of the products we had was a product that was PC based that allowed us to be able to look at how we can uh, do presentations. And uh, that got me in software. I did software for two or three years and did about a half a million dollars in software sales in the product we developed and realized pretty quickly that you, in, in the software business, you either are the leading edge or the, the bleeding edge. And so I decided that, um, that maybe that wasn't the track for me, but the benefits of it, of having a product you own, a product you set the price on, uh, your competition is limited only to people who have something else was really um, something that I wanted to aim for. So books hit that target area. Um, I had listened to a, a, a local doctor in a radio show who was um, syndicated in probably 10 markets. And at that time, low fat diets were a big deal. So I contacted him and said, hey, I'll, we'll write a book. I, I think I have a great idea for it. And um, he, he said, great, I don't wanna put any money or time in it. So essentially we wrote a book in about 90 days, uh, published it and that book went on to sell over 600,000 copies. And um, that book itself allowed me then to uh, going to Book Expo, um, which allowed me to be exposure to publishers. And I did a follow-up book uh, with HarperCollins and actually sold rights to HarperCollins. So the initial book we self-published, uh, we published it under our own imprint, then turned into a book that we started publishing for other major publishers, um, HarperCollins and a few others. And um, that got me into the publishing area. And so I, I learned early on how to drive sales. Uh, what do publishers want? What do um, bookstores want? What do the people want? How do you market it? And um, it's been a great, great learning experience. A lot of things have changed, although books are still a great market to go into. And, um, and so that kind of brings me up to where I am now. Now I primarily develop books, mostly for wealth advisors. Um, that's a niche area. Uh, wealth advisors use books primarily to get new clients. So one of, the, one of the, the, the benefits of doing a book is it's like a business card that people don't throw away. And by having a book that the wealth advisors give out to their clients that helps them introduce themselves to them and helps them get new clients. So even though that book is available in all the major bookstores, we primarily use that book as a tool to uh, attract and engage new clients. So that's what I do for the most part right now. Um, I, I have five or six books that I'm developing right now. And um, I, I very vertically oriented. We start with the idea. We bring it all the way through publication, printing, distribution, establishing the Amazon. Um, it, we look at other bookstores if that's an option we want to, if we want to take. And um, promotion, the whole thing. So I have a pretty broad experience in a very vertical market. Um, so that's a short background of what I've done. 
Excellent. Excellent. I appreciate you getting all the details there. Kind of an expansive uh, multi-decade overview. Now, that, speaking of where it comes down to today with uh, developing publishing books for wealth advisors, you said before that there is no quicker and more effective way to establish authority, make connections, and uncover opportunities than to become a successful author. And I've keyed in on that word successful because success looks a little bit different for different people. Now you, you know what it takes to sell a million copies of various nonfiction titles. You know what it also takes to convert readers into clients. You've also said that there's different types of nonfiction books and that for, for some, a successful author is having in their hands a book that makes them feel good about themselves. So can you tell us about the different different kind of nonfiction That's the worst kind of book, actually. Are? You know, that's that's the book that you don't want. You don't want a book that is a um, is a is a a book that feeds the ego of the author. And I really try to stay away from that. I've done a couple of those books. Um, I've done two in particular. Um, one recently in the last three or four years that probably the author spent one hundred and fifty thousand copies in the book um, in terms of development and printing full color, great book, great idea, and it may be sold 100 copies. So it, it, it can't ever be about the author. So if, you're, if, if the author is hoping to build his reputation, um, build his authority by telling people how great he is, it, it, I, I don't, you're, they're wasting their time. Um, and I, I wouldn't even take those projects anymore. They're not worth it. Um, they're vanity projects and they're really not, they're really not worth it. So I think what you really want to look at are the people who have a great story to tell, they serve their clients, and then how do we take what they do on a one-on-one -on -one basis and do it in a book so that we can scale it? Because if we can do that, then the book can be something that they can sell, they can sell their services, promote their services when they're sleeping. So you never know where those books go. So primarily, I look for, for, for advisors for the most part that offer great value to their, their clients. And I basically look for what their story is. And then I take that story and I turn that into a narrative book, uh, a self-help book in a, in a certain sense, a nonfiction book, a book that gets people to understand what they do without telling them how to do it. Uh, because that's what the, the goal obviously is for the wealth advisor to help them on their journey you know, to financial security. Yeah, I'm curious why the wealth advisor niche out of all of the, the hundreds of different categories and, and books under that fall under self-help. I mean, self-help is everything from getting over addiction to losing weight, to building a business, to finding inner peace. Why, why sure. are wealth advising? Well, first of all, a, a wealth advisor's leverage is really huge because they earn their, their income by how many assets they have under, under, under management. It's called AUM. And essentially, if they can attract somebody that brings in a million dollars and they can earn one or 2% off of that per year, they make a lot of money really quickly. So we have one wealth advisor in particular that has generated over $10 million in profits from the book they did. The book that cost them $70,000, $80,000 to do has generated that much money. So it's a very profitable area. Um, you know, the wealth advising if I had to choose a career now, I would almost choose a wealth advisor because once you bring your clients in, you, 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 know, you, you help them, you show them, you set things up. It's just an ongoing revenue stream for them because they constantly earn money on the assets that are, on, are being managed. So it's a very profitable area. Um, it also allows me to leverage what I do so that as opposed to selling a book one at a time to a end user, I'm selling books as a bulk. And typically the reason why I've sold so many copies of books is by looking at a book as a premium product, as a product that somebody can give away. Um, it's, an, it's an investment for them that can generate 10X, 20X, 100X for them. So you, when you do that, you have an offer they really can't almost refuse because it helps them generate more business. Yes, yes. So books that generate business, frankly seem to, in my experience, what bears it out as well, are the best books to, to write. Um, sometimes they're, they're, they're passion books, like you mentioned before, where you're sharing your knowledge with readers, not expecting a whole lot in return. Maybe it's even only 99 cent ebook. There's resource books revealing how to do something, but, but either of those, it's here is the better, faster, easier, cheaper, more effective, more useful with fewer risks way to do the thing you already want to do. Yep. 
absolutely. Now, it, it doesn't mean that you can't do direct selling also. I mean, some of our earlier books were diet and health books. And we sold books to individual women who wanted to lose weight. That was our target market. So we, we developed channels of, of promotion through women's world, magazines, uh, through, t through TV, through cable. Um, we had a product that we sold as a premium product on QVC uh, that generated sales of 150,000 copies of a book we did. So it really depends on you know, what, what you have to offer. If you're talking to an author, what, who is their market right now? How do you expand that, that market? Um, is it one-on-one -on -one or is it through somebody else? And I think that what you want to do is want a clear idea of what that is, because if you're just going to go out and sell a book to an individual person, the chances of, first of all, having a bestseller is, is almost zero, just about zero. Um, I tell all my clients, the chances of being a bestseller is really, really tough. It's really small. Um, so you have to look at other ways of generating revenue and profit to make it worth the time and effort to do it. Gotcha. Gotcha. Now you said that a book should not be an investment. It should be a money machine, money machine. That's interesting because some people will think, oh, you know, this book, it's a labor of love. It's a passion project, or maybe, maybe I'll break even on it, but you're saying it's not even that it's, it's a, it's a money machine. Most people who are watching this right now, listening to this will, will be thinking, okay, how, how does that apply to my book? What, what can my book do? My, my nonfiction book. I want to write about productivity. I want to write about my business. I want to write about my process. I, do, do I need to have, what do I need to have? That's probably the question in their, in their minds right now. So, so can you speak to exactly that? Building a money yeah, machine. I, I think, sure. We, we did, the, the key to that is before you even start writing a book, before you even think about writing a book, you need to think about who your client is, who your customer is going to be, who your reader is going to be. Um, and you have to have that marketing model in place before you even come out with a book. Because the book simply allows you to be able to help those people on their journey at the same time that you can have something that you can generate revenue and you can scale. So it's really critical that you know what that marketing model is before. What you don't want to do is write that book at a labor of love, get it printed. You know, maybe you're doing it digitally. Maybe you're doing it through a print on demand through Amazon. Really simple. You can do it really quickly and you have zero sales. So you really need to have those things in place beforehand. Um, that comes back to, um, having a, a great cover, um, having a UR, URL that potentially matches the, the name of the, the book itself. Um, you want to look at where your distribution is going to be before you even start writing a book, because what you may find is the, 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 what the book is aiming at is, a, is different than what your market's going to be. And the last thing you want to do is have books sitting on a shelf, sitting in a closet or your garage, Although with print and demand, you don't have it anymore because now you can basically go to print right now and um, order one copy. Um, back 10 years ago, you had to order 5,000 copies or 2,000 copies because you couldn't get a cost per unit low enough to be able to justify it. Um, so I think the key thing is you, you need to, marketing comes before the book. And if you don't do that, odds are your book is not going to sell. Now, when you say distribution, can you explain what you mean by this? Because a lot of people I talk to, when they hear the distribution, they'll think, okay, so I published my book on amazon.com and I talk and I tweet the link to buy my book or I send it to my email subscribers and they go buy it. That's my distribution. Can you, can you uh, blow our minds a little bit and expand this beyond yeah, I think, that? I think distribution comes down to your platform. Um, if you don't have a platform, you're not going to have distribution. I mean, you can, you can have distribution, but no one's going to buy it. Um, and the reason why publishers, major publishers buy books and publish books of you know, the people who are on TV and the, and the, the celebrities is because they have a platform. Um, you know, obviously, if you have a, a big Twitter following or if you have an Instagram or if you have TikTok, that all helps. Although maybe TikTok people aren't buying books, um, but, but still, you need to look at where that, where that market is when you're, that you're aiming at. Um, and you need to make sure that that what you're offering is targeted towards that market. Gotcha. Gotcha. So then the question is, well, what, what's a platform? Is it my, my following online? Is it email subscribers? Is it previous customers? All of those for sure. I mean, you, you know, you need to, you need to have people who you connect with, um, you know, good examples. If we look at the, um, uh, you know, the most successful um, book out there in terms of, of, of habits, um, you know, atomic habits. I mean, the reason why that book has generated $16 million in profit for the for James Clear 
is because he has a million subscribers to his newsletter. And before he even wrote the book, he was setting out as building his newsletter base. So you, you need, the, really the goal of the book, before you get the book, is to have a newsletter base. Because once you have that, you can go back to it multiple times. Um, so you really need a platform and either people have to know you and, and you know, 10,000 or 20,000 people is not going to cut it. You could cut it if they're all going to buy, but most likely they're not. So um, you, you need to spend time on how to expand that platform as quickly as possible. Now, let's bring it back to the, the, mar the vertical that you serve now, wealth management. They probably don't have 10 to 20,000 uh, subscribers. They may have a few dozen or 100 clients or so. So what, okay. what, what is the advice for, for them for, dis for distribution? Okay. Well, again, remember, we're leveraged in terms of we get a client that, that you know, maybe a book costs us $15, $20 uh, delivered to the client. We get a client that could be generating ten or twenty or fifty thousand dollars a year for them, so we have a lot of leverage there. So what we do is we look at first of all we look at who their client list is, and people. One of the best opportunities on if you have if you have clients, you have five hundred clients or a thousand clients or whatever number you have, is to is to go to their family, to go to their friends, and to go to their coworkers. And one of the effective way, ways we do that is we do a book launch, and at the book launch. We, we give away free copies, and we also encourage clients to give us a list of people who are their friends, their workers, their family that want a free copy of the book. So we then send the book out to them directly, and that allows to be able to do the introduction to the, to the new client. So you, you basically get three chan channels that you can go to with every client you already have. Um, also important is depending on who you're, who you're going after, is that once you have a book that allows you to go out to local media. So if you're a wealth advisor and you want to be on a local TV show, you want to get on a morning show or radio show, a book is a great way of doing that. Um, you don't, using the authority of the book, that gives you the opportunity to get on those shows. Uh, also a really important part are podcasts. And most people think, you know, to be successful, I need to have a podcast. If you really want to do it quickly, you don't need a podcast. You need to get on a podcast because if you can find somebody who already has distribution in place in terms of their podcast, getting on there is what can really drive the numbers. Gotcha. So if you don't have a platform, go borrow somebody else's. <laughs> Absolutely. Be a local morning show or be it uh, be it a podcast. Yep. Well, I know that you're a big fan. Um, I mean, you you really advise people to really look at existing books that are out there, look at the comments, look at the people, give them two or three stars, look at what they're complaining about and or what their, what their problems are, and then focus your book on that. That seems to be your strategy there. Um, and I think that that's a, that's a really good strategy to find out what, what the problem is. And I think you always have to be aware of, of how do you find those people? And one of the ways of doing that is if it, 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 it translated into people, uh, in terms of podcasts, look at who their previous guests are. So what you want to do is just like you would identify the person who has the book that's topic you have, you want to do the same thing in podcasts. You want to find somebody who has a podcast, who's talking about your topic and simply Google their name, Google podcast, look at where they've appeared. Then once you know where they've appeared, you know where to target because those people have had that, that subject already on that podcast. And so you essentially can go to that person who's on a podcast on the topic you're talking about that allows you to be able to pitch your book, pitch what you have to have so that you can get in the door on that podcast. That allows you to leverage what you have because, you know, more than likely you're going to get a lot better response on a podcast and you're going to get on broadcast TV. Um, if you get on, I've, we've been on Fox morning show uh, for a book we did called the great fruit solution, which is a the diet book we did back, 15, 20 years ago. And we had three, two segments on Fox. We got lots of attention, but we sold like maybe 10 copies. And the reason being is that people who watch TV aren't necessarily buyers of books. Now, Oprah sold a lot of books, but most TV shows don't. If you look at Fox Now or CN, you know, you know, CNN or MSNBC and the authors they have on there, they're on there all the time. One show, one segment is not gonna sell any books but a podcast can. And the most important thing you want to do with anything you do is drive it back to an email list. Because if you have an email list, you have a way of getting back in touch with them. 
Gotcha. So how, how do you advise your clients to turn readers into email subscribers with their books? Well, I think you want to, you clearly want to offer something in the book uh, something that they can download. It could be a chapter. It could be a worksheet. It could be something that gets them to kind of what their what is their biggest problem and how can you address it? Like right now, uh, we're really looking at inflation. Like how do we help people understand inflation? What are the things they can do to be able to, to stretch their budget? And so I'm working on a series of emails that it can get people to send in to get information on a section of the book that we address that. So you want to you really, and this is where being an author requires you not just to write your book, but to help your clients and help the people who are going to sell your books grow their business. Because if you do that, they're going to they're going to help sell your book. They're going to, they're going to buy your book from you. Absolutely, absolutely. Now you mentioned you mentioned um, uh, in inflation and kind of what people are, are people are concerned about right now, and and that would apply to authors, aspiring authors, be they entrepreneurs who think well maybe a book can give me that authority and help me stand out in the way that I need, or they're just wanting to start a fiction series that they've been wanting to write for 10 years. Um, what, what is the, with the future of publishing in these strange, uncertain times where inflation, depending on what product you're looking at, is as high as 40%? I, you know, to me, it doesn't matter. I, I look at it and I've been through a number of them. You know, I've, I've been through the, you know, the 80s when interest rates were 17, 18%. Matter of fact, our first house we bought, our interest rate was 17 and three eighths. We bought it down by three points. So that's how high it was. You know, I, I went through the, 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 the crashes, you know, the, the dot boom crash, uh, the 2008. I, you know, I, and to tell you the truth, I don't pay attention to it because you really, you really need to do is you look at what, the, what are concerns of people right now? How do you help them achieve a goal they have? Deal with the problem. And if you focus on that, everything else doesn't really matter. You don't need, you know, 300 million people to buy your book. You know, you need 10,000 people to buy your book. Now, maybe you have a great book that sells, you know, 16 million copies. You know, maybe that, maybe you do that. You know, maybe you're James Clear. But you don't need that. So I think that the key is, as long as you're focused on what the problems are of your reader, then I think that you can address those. And the closer you get to what is the, the thing that really bothers the most, the, the better chance you have. Uh, yeah, but Steve, book, how do I figure out what that is? How do I know if readers want to know what I know? Well, you know that because you're going to, you, if, if you read the papers, if you go on book sites, if you see what people are complaining about, um, just listen to what people are complaining about. That's the most, that's the easiest way. You know, obviously inflation is really big right now, but I think that I, I wouldn't target just inflation. I target something, something, a subset of that because it, it's a catchphrase for everything. Um, you know, you may want to look at how do you target it down something even smaller than that. Um, and you want to look at how big that market is and then what you can do to help them get through that, that problem, that challenge. Um, you know, a real important point is a person only needs one reason to buy your book. They don't need 10. They don't need five. They don't need three. They need one. If you can help them with one thing, they'll buy your book. And the closer you make it to what they're thinking about, you know, it's a persuasion thing. It's a Scott Adams thing. You know, if you can, if you can, if you can say what they're thinking about, then you can get their attention. And if you can offer a solution, then you have an opportunity to, to, to bring them in the fold. Gotcha. Gotcha. Say the thing that they're thinking about. How do I figure out what that is, Steve? Well, I'm going to ask you that because I think you probably already know. I mean, I think that, that, um, people give clues all the time. I mean, right now you can kind of guess what it is. Um, you know, politics is lit on fire. Um, and I think it's best just to stay out of politics. So if you're an, if it, I would not even do a politics book. I wouldn't do a nonfiction politics book. Um, but I, I think that, that if you get pulled in there, I think it's going to take you away from hearing what people are really talking about. In, in your expertise level. So whatever you're good at, whatever you're great at, you need to be close in that field and don't make it about politics because um, you're kissing off half your market to begin with and you're going to get embroiled and it's not worth it. Gotcha. Gotcha. Now, I think you brought up a good point, which is what most people are talking about. And in order to hear what people are talking about, so we know what the one reason is that they're going to buy the book, um, we often may need to eliminate the noise, eliminate the noise from 
from our feeds, from uh, from our email newsletters, from from the political noise and drama noise from the news, but if you really focus on what it is that they what it is that they want, you'll find that it's a lot easier to describe it and then turn it into um, advice. I took I took someone through this exercise a few minutes ago, Steve. It was somebody who said he thinks he needs to do a book for the authority, the credibility, and the protection of expertise. But of course, he said, you know, I don't I don't know. Does anybody want to really want a book on this? So I, I Googled it. I pulled up some keyword research and long tail keywords associated with his expertise have increased by almost, by almost 200% and year over year of wow. the actual number of people searching that topic. Other keywords were 60% increase. And then there was a graph showing over the last 20 years of internet searches, this uh, it was like a non-linear progression of interest in this topic. I'm like, yep. you see it right here. The numbers are showing you that people are searching for this. And he's like, okay. Okay. Um, but like, how do I make people want to buy the book? How do I, how do I give them a reason to buy it? You know, how do I, how do I actually know that they're going to look at it and say, I need that. And I gave him this simple formula and I asked him to fill in the blank. I said, here is your subtitle, a proto subtitle. Don't even have to use this, but it's an exercise. How to blank. So that blank, how to blank. So that blank. And he thought for a good minute and then he, well, how to, he filled it in so that it's like, oh, I would buy that book. Yep. Everybody I know in this market wants to buy that book. And it, the, the light bulb went off. How to, so that. If you can put your book in that simple formula, how to, so that, and people want that, well, there you go. There you go. It's I, not, uh, not taking really hard there. Yeah, I think that t- typically I would do that as a subtitle. I mean, because I yeah. think that subtitles could be as short or as long as possible. I think that you want your title to be something that grabs your attention. Um, hopefully something that drives them to a website, to a landing page, something that's simple. And then your subtitle is really where you can put that in there. And I think that's what drives your message um, and everything you do. Uh, I think you use that subtitle. Uh, if you're approaching media, you want to be able to uh, go to your local media and you want to talk about what that title is. You may want to do that before you even start the book. Because it's great to get feedback on is it something to be of interest or not. Um, I would I would develop those media contacts as you're writing the book for sure. Excellent, excellent. Well, that's been real real helpful, uh, Steve. A little back and forth there. Now, how do you feel about turning to a little question and answer session from uh, from people who submitted their questions before? Absolutely, this I'm ready. Okay, so I tweeted a few minutes ago that we would be talking to the the OG of book publishing, um, and uh, people had questions that they want to ask. So we'll start with the most recent one. Um, at Panda Tribune asks you, Steve, how important is the book cover for sales? Critical. It's more important if your book is in a books in a bookstore, um, which is limited. But I think that I can tell immediately on most covers if it's if it's a, if it's serious or not doesn't have to be complex, but I think you want to have something that looks like a book that a major publisher would do. So you don't want to, you know, you don't want a book that looks that it was done on your, on your, on your computer, that it was done through some, some amateur. It doesn't mean you have to spend a lot of money doing it, but I think you need to have a professional. Uh, typically my process is I, once I work up a, a, a title name uh, that I feel comfortable with, um, I will have some concepts together and then I'll go to a designer and have the designer do it. Um, and it's not cheap for the designer I use, but there are some people you can go to that are less expensive. Um, I think that the colors you choose, how big your font is, um, in a lot of ways, it's like a landing page. You don't want to give, you don't want to have too much information. Um, it's like a guy wearing a suit. You know, you don't want to have, you don't want to match the tie with the, the, the stripes in the shirt. You want bold colors that stand out, that are easy to read. And I think that um, a cover is, a, a title and a cover are the most important things that they're going to see. The back cover, what you say, is the most important thing you say. Because the back cover is, if you look at somebody who buys a book, they're going to look at the front cover. Next thing they're going to do is they're going to turn it over and they're going to read it. And if they're interested, then they're going to fan the book and then they're going to make a decision to buy it or not. So your first one is you got to look good. Second is you got to be able to describe briefly what it is, why it will help them in their problem. What, what are their problem? How do they help? How do you help them solve it? And then how does it feel? Does it feel good? 
Um, you don't want it to feel like it's a cheap little, um, you know, pamphlet. Gotcha. Very helpful. Very helpful. One thing that I would add is that I, I believe the number is 85% of, uh, of like direct marketing, 85% of books are sold on amazon.com nowadays, not, not in bookstores. And so most people's books will be discovered as a thumbnail, as yep. a little tiny picture. And so if it's too busy, if the fonts are skinny, if the title is small, people are, as they're scrolling down the results on Amazon, they're not going to see what the book title even is on that book cover. Yep. A lot of times what I'll do is I'll look at covers out there already. And I, when I see a cover I like, it gets my attention. I'll just save it. Um, but for the most part, the, the, the key in the cover is what the designer does with it. Um, you know, we did a cover a few years ago that we literally had custom artwork done. Uh, we had a person who did scratch art. Scratch art is where you have uh, wax and you, you scratch off and, and it's probably one of the best covers we've ever done. So um, you, you want it to look good. Thumbnail is important. Um, you know, Amazon is where most of your sales will come if you sell the book in single copies. Um, if you're selling it in bulk, um, you know, which you really should do because you're not going to make a lot of money by selling single copies unless you have a huge platform. So um, cover cover is critical. Excellent, excellent. Now we have an interesting question that takes us uh, uh, maybe a little bit more, more difficult question. It's from Cynthia Yaki at Conservative Les. She asks, how can you market your nonfiction book when it is nearly the same as more famous books? This question is for clients who need their book as a credential for their consulting or coaching business. How do you market your book when it's nearly identical to previously published more famous books? Well, I think it's like anything else when you're first starting out, you look at young people who are starting out in sales and how can they sell if they've never sold against somebody who's really sold a lot. And it really comes down to one thing, they make more calls, they make more contacts. So I think that people who, um, who are established for the most part, they get lazy. I mean, some don't, some people are aggressive, they work all the time, but they get, they, they back off. And so I think what you need to do is you need to look at who's, who's the potential for this book? Who, who can you get to that has um, a following you can build a relationship with, that you can get a, a blurb from, that you can use to be able to, um, to, to leverage on who they know? So building a personal relationship is probably really important. Make, um, make 10 calls a day trying to reach out to people who can give you a cover bl blurb or can review the book. Um, likely you won't get a review, but you may get a quote. And if you get a quote, you can use that on future direct mail contacts. Um, if I was in the coaching business, I would wanna look at how do I leverage local media? Because um, if I'm in, in a particular area, how do I, how do, I do that? Um, and the best way of doing it is to, is to pick up the phone, uh, make friends with them on LinkedIn, send them a cold email, make a cold contact. Um, and just outwork the person who's the expert. Gotcha, gotcha. Now to that, to that point, someone else asked, uh, at I Love Space Force, he asked, after the book is written, how does one break out with a tiny network? So I guess the question is here, how do you, how do you get the word of your book out uh, beyond your own, uh, your own tiny network and, and well, sell if, a lot if of that's copies? A, if that's the question as it is, you, you probably made a mistake because you didn't do what we talked about beforehand, which is you build your network before your book comes out. Yes. So let's assume that you have the book and it's, you, know, you spend all your time developing the book and it's a great book and you, now you need to expand it. I think you need to make contacts. You need to look at how this book can help somebody's business, how it can help them personally. And I think that you need, if, if you can't help them personally, then I think then um, the chances of you selling many copies is going to be pretty low and you're probably not going to get a lot, of, a lot of other things from it. So I, I think it comes down, you got to out hustle people. Um, you know, you never know where that contact is that's going to give you the juice or give you the, the exposure you need to be able to get in somebody else's hands. Um, I, I think that right now with the amount of blog posts and podcasts that are out there right now, I think the best way of doing it is to reach out to those people who have a demand for guests and for articles and make their life easier by giving them something that they can simply read over and they can plug into their existing channel of distribution. Gotcha, gotcha. So we've, I've been in women's world uh, with some of our books probably 
10 times and I've secured uh, four or five mate covers on Women's World, which literally went in every single grocery store. Um, the gener sales generator were huge, huge, and it didn't cost me anything. Um, the key is, is that you, you got to get to those folks. And if you can do that, that's, that will help you expand it. So, and you could do that after the book is done. So I think the, the, the look at the media as they need content. You need to provide content to their readers. So look at, look at what they articles they've done, look at their approach, who are they trying to help show them how your book can help them do that. Do an outline of a story pitch. And one of the ways we got Women's World is we literally did a story pitch. We gave them what the headline was, subtitle, we gave them pictures, we gave them everything. And of course they changed it and they did the interview and they did the photo shoot. They flew the person out for the photo shoot. But for the most part, make their life, make those lives easier for those people who are the podcasters and the bloggers and you'll get exposure. Excellent, excellent. And that was a question that uh, Linda uh, Whaley asked is, what does what platform does, uh, does Steve recommend an author establish a presence on? Uh, it seems like you're saying uh, anyone that will have you, somebody else's platform, someone with, uh, yep. with an audience. <laughs> I, you know, I think at the beginning, you know, you, you go wherever you can go. I mean, you, you, you get experience. So you, you, um, you want to look at locally or people who you know, um, maybe you don't know them. I think the key is just to, and that's where a book can help because if you send a book to them, with a, um, a an outline of, of a potential you know pitch, I think that credibility you get with a book can get them to read that pitch. If you just contact someone cold and say, hey, I want to be in your podcast, they're gonna they're not gonna want to do it. Um, I think that you want to look at how you can help them, and that credibility of that book will help. So um, it, it all comes down to how hard you want to work. Yeah, yeah. You've got, some, you've got some authors that you've done that that are always posting on Twitter. They're always they're always working. They're always giving out content. They're selling copies because they're offering value. Yes, yes, and I, I do want to praise praise slash pitch my uh, my client, yeah, Dr. Philip Ovedia. Yep. That's what I was thinking. Of. Now this, yeah, yeah, this book is selling thousands of copies. Um, it's been out for what uh, eight months now, and he is still doing podcast interviews. He, he has put in his queue, he used, I think he uses um, uh, Hype Fury. A lot of, a lot of people, a lot, a lot of author clients will use Hype Fury for their social media management. They'll put stuff in there and just schedule it out so that there's always something about their book, that they're always promoting it on, on their channels, but they're still going out and doing podcasts and they're doing public speaking appearances. And they'll, they will talk about what they know to anyone who will listen. Even, even smaller audiences, seemingly shows that have very little distribution. I mean, if you look at the, the people who are artists, the people who were, um, you know, in bands, they didn't start out playing, you know, big concerts. They did, they, they did them everywhere. Look at comedians. They do, they, even today, they check out their sets, um, you know, to make sure they have something lands before they go, you know, on major cable. You know, it's not a matter of, of, of just walking up performing. You got to practice on it. So if I was an expert in any area, I would look at how I can help people and I would look at who talks to those people and I would help those people show them they can make their job easier by showing what I have for them. So um, it's, it, it's pretty fail safe. Yeah, yeah. That makes me think of um, uh, advice I've given authors before, which is, which is this. I guess it's not so, it, bound up within it is advice, Steve, but it's more like a, an insight which is the best way to sell books is for someone else to tell their audience, you need to go buy your book. Yep. It's with the host has you on. Well, that, that's a wrap. Thanks so much for being, uh, being with us today. And before you, uh, before you stop here, make sure you go pick up a copy of the book available on such and such place. That is the best pitch for a book. It's not you saying, go buy my book. It's the person who's interviewed you for 15, 20 minutes, an hour and a half, two hours, for them to say, tell their audience that trusts them, then you have to go buy this book. This thing is yeah. good. I agree. And I think that one other thing I tweak that is I would, I would make some kind of download offer that is relevant to what you talked about in the show that's free, that someone can go to a simple landing page to be able to, to put their email address in. Because once you have that email address, you then can just, you, you can send them out emails on a regular basis. So, um, 
the, the, the problem with any media is if they, if, if someone asks you to do something, it's short lived. If you can get an email address, address, you obviously can use that to your advantage for a long period of time. So I would look at how can you offer something for free? And in women's world, we did that. This is back uh, just right when the web is starting up. Um, we had an 800 number that people would call to get, um, to get a free offer, free recipes. And we literally had, I shouldn't use that word, literally. <laughs> um, we had so many people calling, we could not answer the phone because they would get a busy signal. So we left to go to answering. And all we had, what we did is had two people calling into answering to be able to get the, the voicemails so we can get their name and address because the information out to them. And we sold 10,000 copies of the book and we, we had a list of 50,000 people who uh, gave us their names and we you know, rented the list out. So there's, there's all kinds of ways of doing that. The key is to offer something really relevant, uh, something that is to the talk. So it could be, uh, I wanna send you a free chapter. I wanna send you a worksheet. I wanna send you something that can help you start it today. And when you do that, you then can put the book, the link to Amazon, um, and, um, and you can go back to the well many times. Awesome. Now you mentioned the free, freebies, freebies. Um, at Linda Whaley had also asked, does giving free copies out as a download help or hurt a book's sales potential? I don't think it hurts, but I, I don't see a lot of free copies helping. I, I, I mean, you know, first of all, I think any book, any print book you have, you need to have a digital copy because some people like Kindles. Okay. Um, you need to have um, an audio version. I mean, if your book is relatively good, because there are a lot of people who, especially nonfiction, will buy an audio book. Um, you know, it's roughly 8% of the sales, book sales now are audio books. It's growing at uh, 20% per year. So it's a pretty substantial amount. Um, so I, I think that um, all our books we do, we do digital versions. Um, I think that it may be 10% of the sales. Um, I think you could do promotions within Kindle who offer for free or you offer for a dollar. Um, there's some benefits in doing that. Um, but I, I don't know. I, I kind of believe that you price your, you, you, you set a higher price and then you offer a sale or an inducement. And an inducement may be something extra. I don't, I'm not a big believer in discounting. I'm not a big believer in selling for something for $1.99 unless your goal is to build an email list to be able to sell them something later on. Um, I like even numbers. I like bigger numbers because I can always discount off of that. Yes. Yes. Oh, right, we got one, one more set of questions here. This is Noble Brown at Sociopathly. He asked, is Amazon the best option for independent authors? I'm assuming like that the primary place to publish and, and promote your book and send readers back to. Well, it's kind of like the only place now when you think about it. I mean, you know, you know, Amazon has, the, the digital, Amazon has the print, it now has uh, for, for, for paperback, but now they're coming out with hardcover and they have the audible. So they pretty much have all of them. Um, you know, Barnes and Noble, I, I've sold the Barnes Noble for, for 25, 30 years. Their sales is infinitesimal. You know, books a million yeah. is, um, is virtually nothing. Um, you know, the airport stores, we've, we've secured distribution airport stores and sold pretty well, but who's, I mean, that's questionable now because of flying everything else. Um, I think we use, Am in, in our publishing business for wealth advisors, we use Amazon to set the price. So I would set a book in our books, maybe 22 or $28. So we establish the price of the book. And then, then we offer for free to somebody as a client and they have value to it. If we sold the book for $1.99 as digital or as free, the value we gave, you know, if we gave it away would be zero. So um, I kind of think that you establish a high price, and then you uh, you, you you offer something um, as as uh, valuable, either an additional service, you give it away for free. Um, I, I think that you really have no other option but Amazon. But I would definitely what I would court is I would look at people you can sell in books as books by the box. You know who can buy. 25 copies, 50 copies, 1,000 copies. Um, we did a QVC book for a supplement product. We sold over 120,000 copies of a book. And, um, you know, the book caught, it was a small little book, but the book generated a profit for everyone we sold. So, you know, 
it's it, it's something that you you need to look at. Um, if you can sell them in bulk, who can buy five copies or ten copies of your book? You'd be much better off focusing that early on when you did it, as opposed to doing it after the fact. Gotcha, gotcha. For example, yeah. for example, your your health your your heart book. What I would do yeah. with that is I would contact doctors who are doing what he's doing, and I would offer that book at a big discount. I would I would offer to do it, make it a dollar a book. I would say, you know, maybe he sells the book at a you know a paperback version of the book is probably three dollars for Amazon. I'd sell it to four dollars and say that a cardiovascular doctor when he's doing doing a service, you should use a book to help bring people in. And I would ha sell books by the carton to doctors. Excellent. Yeah, no, he has sold books uh, in, in bulk. Uh, a, lot, a lot of been medical professionals wanted to get it, get it for everybody, his Perfect. staff, you know, families, like you know, get everyone for everyone in the extended family, that sort of thing. Um, I think that's that's wise. You know, you mentioned the the hard work. I think this would be a good a good a good the best sell a book is to the best, highest leveraged activities. You know, and one of the most leveraged activities is selling one copy of your online. That's the highest leverage activity is to sell a lot of books to a lot of people at once. And for most authors, that's going to be giving interviews. That's going to be going live in someone's Facebook group and you're know, giving away 10 copies of your book. Or, you know, I, I, we're going to give away 10 copies of the audiobook free for 10 people who show up here. going to be random about this audiobook for free. Something simple like that. You know, I had a friend, yeah, he sold, sold 4,000 books in a day in someone's Facebook group. It was a pretty big Facebook group, um, but you can't get that kind of result from, from traditional media, from, from the broadcast media. But that's really it, is who wants to buy a lot of copies of, their, of your book? And for some, it's going to be the influential person. It's going to be the executive who wants their C-suite, everyone reading this book. It's going to be yeah. that I want to buy this for the board of advisors and, and, and uh, you know, and this, I, want, I want everyone on my team to have this book. I want all my managers to have a copy of this book. It's going to be those people that you want to market to. And then what shows do they listen to? What content do they consume? A lot of yep. them. And how do you find that person that has reach within that community so that when the host says, now everybody go buy this guest's book, you sell dozens, hundreds, thousands of copies from one effort showing up for an hour. Yep, absolutely. And I think what you really, what the, the, the summary, the most basic thing you could do right now if you're doing a book is to have those thoughts and those conversations and the strategies now before you write the book. Yes. It's not that you can't do something afterwards, but your max, your, your ability to craft that book, craft that offer, to look at where your market is, you have that opportunity very early on. You want to make sure you take advantage of it. 100%. 100%. I think that's a good jumping off point for, for today. Uh, Steve, any, any last thoughts before we farewell to our viewers? That's great. No, I think that, um, I mean, first of all, I, I appreciate what you've done. Um, you know, clearly you're, you are an expert at writing, and I think that 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 authors have great ideas and need a person like you. So, um, you know, as we talked before, we're not in competition with each other because you're a writer, I'm a book developer. Um, but um, I, I think that uh, the service you provide is is really outstanding. Excellent, thank you, and, and same to you. And to that end, where can people find me? I'm sorry, you're breaking up a bit. I just asked, I said, where, where can people find you on, uh, I know you're, 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 you post a lot of good stuff on Twitter. Uh, you got a website as well. Where, where do you want to send Yeah, people? you can go to linkscorp, L-I-N-X-C-O-R-P.com. It's all one word. Um, we do have a 10 step of developing a book download. You can get there if you want to get it. Um, you know, Twitter um, is just, is just my, um, my name, Steve Ampu. Uh, obviously you have it on there. Um, Interestingly, I don't use Twitter for the most part to, to attract new clients. Um, I use it really to find out what people are thinking and what they're talking about, the experts that are out there. So we talked about earlier about books and how do you know what's important, what is, what is interesting. That to me is, is Twitter is great for that. Market research tip to close us off, Steve. Thank you so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thanks, Joshua. You bet.